Hello everyone, welcome back. Ready for part two here. I'm gonna get right into it here again. This is gonna be your, I think, six decks to bring or prepare for for the Dallas uh, challenge next week from when I'm recording this or your local game store from when you, uh, this is being recorded for your set championships. Try to win that Ursula. Next up, we've gone through so far in the video for the first video, we've gone through Ruby Amethyst, we've gone through uh, Green Steel, and we've gone through uh, Ruby Sapphire, the three decks I think people have expected to see the most of, and according to the percentages, three of the most popular decks in the metagame. The fourth one, kind of rounding out what was previously called the Big Four, is what I played. I played Blue Steel in Chicago. Now, this isn't exactly the list I played. This is a kind of an updated version there, taking into consideration some metagame developments that have happened. Uh, a lot of changes have, have happened, but, you know, the more things change, the more things stay the same, I say, in some ways. So, while... This may not be exactly what I end up playing in Chicago if I if I or not Chicago in Dallas if I if I do play this deck again this is where I'm at currently and what I'm thinking about when I'm trying to prepare for my own set championships and the weekends to, the week to follow here uh, we're gonna go through some of the the more unique cards here um, the first thing I'm gonna kind of start with is the lack of Smee Smee is a card I think a lot of people have tied on to and will consistently gravitate towards because. Smee is a good card in a blue steel mirror match. It is very good. It is very good at putting aggressive pressure on in the early game, and a 3 3 is actually kind of annoying to deal with sometimes. It is very good and has always been good in the mirror matches and can be part of the early game lore swing that makes closing out the late game all the easier. However, when I'm thinking about the context of threats I'm playing against, there are four big threats in the game right now that I am scared of in the early game. The four threats are Diablo, Bucky, Flynn, and Sisu. Those are the four cards I want to deal with. Smee doesn't line up against any of those four in any kind of profitable way except for Flynn a little bit. So while Smee checks a Flynn, Smee does not do anything against a Sisu. Smee does not do anything against a Diablo. Smee does not do anything against a Bucky. You'll see the other cards here I've included on my two drop slots are Argus. Argus is a vanilla 4-1. Why are we playing a vanilla 4-1? It doesn't work against Diablo. It doesn't do much against Bucky. But what it does do really well is check Flynn in the fact that it has more strength than Flynn, and also check Sisu. How does it check Sisu? Well, it might not stop Flynn from gaining three lore immediately at the start of turn, you know, the turn after it's played, because your hand size might be greater than the, greater than three, meaning that they, their Sisu is still big enough. It does trade for Sisu. It is for strength. And in all honesty, if you look at the video prior to this one, there's no answers for a card like Argus in Ruby Amethyst. There's no way to deal one damage to anything easily at all. It has to trade with the full card in some way or the other. And Argus can trade straight into a Sisu. It can also help challenge a a, um, a castle pretty effectively. Four strength, four power into it. And again, there aren't that many one-cost characters in the Ruby Amethyst deck, so Argus is going to trade for something that costs the same as it always, pretty much. There's, again, the Turnbox followers is about it, but again, that's one card they're not drawing as well. So Argus is actually something that is teched in this deck for specifically Ruby Amethyst, which I did play against several times in the challenge. I think I played against it twice in, in Chicago, around 1 and 2, and I was 3 and 1 in games against it. I lost a close one where uh, I can't remember the exact details there, but I think it might have been some mistakes or something I wasn't expecting. Uh, at the time, Beaking on Speed was a little bit less popular, and at my point, I played the third copy that kind of got me in some ways, but Argus... Certainly an improvement there in that matchup. And moving on to Magic Broom, again, talking about the things that this checks. It does check Diablo. It doesn't do anything against Bucky. Nothing does anything against Bucky. Let's just move on from Bucky. It also checks Flynn, just by being a two-power character in play. And it doesn't do anything against Sisu. So again, of the four cards I'm worried about, it checks two of them, where Smee only ever checked one. So that's why I'm playing Magic Broom and Argus. A split, because I'm not certain if I want to hedge more towards beating Sisu or Diablo. Maybe the flexibility is right. Maybe I should be playing four copies of one and not the other, and just pick a pick a side to be on. With If I were to do that, I'd be playing four Arguses, because I have Babooms to deal with Diablos. So if I were metagaming and really trying to hammer home for beating a Ruby Amethyst, I'd be playing four Arguses and zero Magic Brooms. That's where I'd be at with that. But for right now, I don't know which one's correct. Maybe by the time Dallas comes around, I'll do another video of what I'm actually going to be playing. Uh, the card for card list will be will be up the 24 hours before uh, the actual event on, on one of the tiers of the Patreon here um, and on YouTube after the event. But it could be the fact that I'm playing four Arguses. You never know. Um, one copy of Bell. Previously in in Chicago, I had had uh, two copies of Ariel and one and three copies of Tomato. So five big lore characters in total during the event itself. Ariel was the only card I wish I'd only played one of when I'd played two. 
as only card during the tournament I wish I'd changed. There were multiple times where the unequal count I'd had. I think at that time I was at 17. I'm now down to, I believe, 15, maybe 16. I can't count right now. But I think I wanted to just have another inkable card. And while the flexibility of Ariel and the resiliency of Ariel was felt in certain matchups, I did play against Ruby uh, Ruby Sapphire three times, and I was collectively 5-1 and one against it. The one game I lost, Ariel would not have made a difference. And the games I won, Ariel wasn't really a big factor in. It was more so the fact that uh, another part of the deck, which we'll get to, uh, where I felt like this deck has a better matchup into that matchup than it did prior. But I think that Bell's a good um, mid-game kind of threat as well. Uh, it does demand an answer. It can get brawled for sure, which is fine. Uh, it's more so they have to brawl it than they get to brawl it. Uh, and in a pinch, it can just be from hand, five lore late in the game. With Lucky Dime, when you may not be able to deploy both Lucky Dime and Palmato in the same turn, you can lead off by deploying Lucky Dime and Bell and maybe activating in the same turn. That is a 13 ink play where trying to Tomatoa and Dime is a 17 ink play, so you can preempt the Tomatoa by going Bell, Dime, and then activating it for five. And then Tomatoa and Dime's already in play, so you don't have to you know, pay the additional seven for that. It's a fine card. It may help you ramp uh, in some ways if you draw it off a whole new world and, and are able to play more things into it. Um, but yeah, I like the one. I don't see myself playing two, but there's the potential if things were a little bit different. But I don't think in this metagame where we have as much Ruby Amethyst, I want to play too many Bells. Gramatala is a notable inclusion. It's a fine card. It's, again, I think probably a card I won't ultimately end up playing in this deck, um, mainly because it doesn't do specific things, which I really want all my cards to be specifically in the deck for their, their explicit purpose. Um, this deck doesn't have a shortage of cards. This is actually one of the decks in the game besides Rumi Amethyst that draws the most amount of cards between Harm, Flavor Sham, and Holy World. Gramatala is kind of filler. It does do a good job when going first uh, off a of one jump ahead of checking Flynn. When we talked about previously how Flynn is very good against uh, people trying to one jump to Harm, Gramatala at least checks the Flynn in that instance. And it's a fine body, and I wanted more four cost characters to, to play off of one jump ahead. And I do think, again, we'll get to the one jump ahead in a minute, but. I think that Gramatala is a good way to round out that 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 desire for those types of cards and that and that space on our curve. Um, Harm Flavor Sham, not really anything to say. One of the best cards in the game, probably in the top five, maybe maybe top ten. I'd say I think Quill is still a bit better than Flavor Sham as a whole. Um, Cogsworth, Cogsworth is a card which has gone up and down in popularity a bunch. Cogsworth inherently is not very good against the Ruby decks, uh, specifically Ruby Sapphire. It is poor into Sisu. Uh, Sisu is one of the reasons that. Cogsworth has gone down a lot in popularity as far as uh, this deck. It's not been cut from the deck, I don't think, in any way, but it's something you should never really play against Ruby Sapphire unless you absolutely have to, and it's maybe on curve or ahead of schedule. Um, but it's a really good card against any Steel matchup. It's one of the best cards into Green Steel. They have no way to remove it. They can't Bruno it. They can't do anything about it, and it makes all of their removal kind of do nothing against your other characters in play. And Cogsworth is, again, one of the best characters in that matchup, which one of the big reasons to play this deck is is inherently good against green and steel. It just lines up pretty darn well against Bucky and Diablo, having a bunch of answers for Diablo, and having a bunch of card draw to get around Bucky. And that combination of a ton of ways to deal with Diablo and a ton of ways to draw a bunch of cards is really a nightmare for green steel. But Cogsworth plays its role in that matchup just by being a character that you can deploy to then sing if you're feeling lucky with Hole in the World, meaning you don't feel like they're going to get Ursula your Hole in the World, or maybe you have two Hole in the Worlds. Um, but yeah, great card. Not really looking to cut anytime soon. Um, Beast Hardheaded. It's a card I played in Chicago, and I'm on the fence about playing again. Its primary purpose is to play against other Sapphire decks specifically, uh, blowing up cards like Fishbone Quill or Ice Block or you know anything that's in play as an item. There's not too many things. Maybe if uh, Amber Steel comes back up a bit, which we, I'm going to bring up here in a little bit, uh, it helps at blowing up Sleepy's Flutes, which you have some answers to Sleepy's Flute and Rise of the Titans, but... It is a fantastic card in the mirror match. Um, if one person is going first and gets to quill into beast, and the other person quills and then gets their quill beasted, it's really hard to come back from because often quill will be in in play, helping set up a Tinkerbell uh, just from going from turn three to turn six. And if they miss that beat, if they don't have a Cogsworth or a beast of their own uh, to only play on five ink after they got their quill blown up, it can really be devastating because it's not only a singer, but also set them back. Uh, as far as development goes. So it's really a mirror breaker. There was a point in time where people were playing more Maurice's workshops, and that was a card you wanted to have answers to as well. Uh, it is pretty blank into Green Steel and against Ruby Amethyst, so that's why it may be taking a backseat um, for me personally in Dallas, but we'll see. I have a bit of time to decide and see what I expect to play against based off of 
a little bit more time and data and murmurings of, of how said championships are going to go for people and, and where everyone thinks the metagame is at, maybe with some, some other events that are going on. Uh, not to the, quite the scale of a challenge or uh, and a little bit bigger maybe than some of the set championships, but we'll see. Maybe some big set championships have a little bit of data to pull from. I'll look at more deck lists from uh, Bachum. We'll see. This is the Tinkerbell deck. Uh, Tinkerbell's Giant Fairy has not been this good since set one, of course, dealing with cards like Bucky, uh, but also against Ruby Amethyst, it is just a really big threat and hard to deal with. Um, they do have Bee King Undisputed, which is something to consider uh, when including cards and playing cards out like Magic Broom and Argus. It may be not correct to make favorable trades into, say, a Sisu with Argus. You can certainly see someone questing with a Sisu with an Argus in play uh, when you're about to play a Tinkerbell as bait to get you to trade with your Argus to then clear the way for Tinkerbell, but that's a complicated kind of board state, but Tinkerbell is very good. Um, dealing with Bucky is one of its primary functions, and it is just very hard to deal with character that makes questing untenable for most decks. Uh, not many decks can quest into an active Tinkerbell. Uh, mainly the other Sapphire decks are the only exception, but even then, uh, it can be an uphill battle, and w one of the best cards against uh, Ruby, uh, Ruby Amethyst is the combination of Tinkerbell and Grab Your Swords. We see three copies of Grab Your Swords here, uh, one of the only decks that can still play that many copies because of Fishbone Coal, essentially. Uh, and that combination being able to deal three to everything, while it doesn't kill Sisu, kills pretty much everything else that you'd care about. Uh, all the small little things that, that cost less than, than four. Um, or four or less, I should say. So, yeah. Tinkerbell, Grab Your Sword, the key way this deck tries to get back into the game. Tamatoa has been a card that's not been uh, always an inclusion on, in Blue Steel, but it's kind of crept back into the deck, and t this deck's taken a shell similar to how uh, Ruby Sapphire played in the previous format, and Tamatoa's just fit incredibly well. Really, again, we'll skip ahead here to the item package right below Tamatoa. Popsicle, Ford Sphere, Fishmonko, Lucky Diamond. It's 14 items, but eight of them are cantrips. This deck really took off and I think was a contender for me because the inclusion of Fortisphere, just giving the deck a critical mass of items better than any other deck to really make Tamatoa a giant threat. And I've had multiple games come down to the fact that I have a dime in play already and we've gotten to the late game and I've been able to play a second dime and a Tamatoa and immediately just gain 20. It's not uncommon, it is possible, and it kind of makes your Tamatoas incredible burn spells, really, if you think of it from a term from Magic. They're just 10-point shots or 8-point shots all at once. And it's really hard to come back from that type of effect. And one of the main reasons I think that this deck actually has a somewhat of an advantage in certain games against Ruby, uh, Ruby Sapphire is the fact that it gets to keep more items in play. Ruby Sapphire does uh, have the same amount of items, typically, around 14, depending on how many ice blocks they play and how many other random items they play. But this deck doesn't need to sacrifice its items to uh, draw cards. You don't have to Flavor Sham with this deck where Ruby Sapphire does. If they want to keep it on pace with you and up on the card advantage kind of war there, which can be at their detriment, they have to sacrifice their items. So their Tomatoas are going to always be weaker in that sense. However, their Tomatoas are much harder to remove. And one of the reasons you still have to play cards like Let It Go in this deck, but this deck not having to use its items for the card draw off Flavor Sham and getting to lean on Whole New World is one of the big parts of how this deck actually beats that matchup, is not using Flavor Sham explicitly. And one of the reasons that Fishbone Quill is so much better in this deck than it is in Ruby Sapphire uh, is, as I said previously, the Fishbone Quills have had a lot less to utilize from your opponent's side. There's a lot less Whole New Worlds playing around because Amber Steel has been on a severe decline and some versions of Blue Steel have not been playing it as well, that Ruby Sapphire does not get to use Fishbone Quill as effectively. What you get to do in this deck is you get to dictate how powerful Fishbone Quill is when you're playing as Ruby, uh, Ruby Sapphire by having a whole new world. You get to be the one to say, okay, I'm going to ink this turn, and then you might have the feeling you need to ink out, and then I get to whole new world you. Right, I, I wouldn't want a whole new world you need to do it in preparation for it, but maybe I don't have it. I'm trying to get you to just empty your hand. But really being able to dictate the hand size and how good Fishbone Quill is going to be in, it, in the matchup or in any given game, for me, lets me kind of try and build towards games where I have multiple Fishbone Quills in play and where I have the ability to have a plethora of items and never have to really use Flavor Sham, so I get to keep that massive amount of items to build towards those turns with Lucky Dime and Tomatoa. And of course, having answers to opposing items uh, like Beast, or, sorry, items like Lucky Dime with Beast and Rise of the Titans 
really gives this deck a bit of an edge, I think, in that matchup specifically. Certainly, there'll be times where you can't come back. There are games where you're just able to get, you know, they're able to essentially kill all your characters on curve along the way. That happens rarely, but sometimes when going second, it's a little bit difficult to do so. When going first, it never really happens, I would say. It's it's very hard to, to imagine a world where you have a semi-functioning hand and they're able to keep pace with you in that way to where they're going to lock you out from being able to do your thing or sing a whole world even. But it can happen. It's a little bit, you know, hit or miss. But I think at the very worst, I think it's a 50-50 matchup. But I I personally think it's a little bit of advantage for Blue Steel um, when played correctly, uh, which I wish we could show some play, but I uh, don't have the ability to do so right now. Um, but yeah, moving on. Some of the more other, uh, some of the other actions in the deck there. We have uh, de facto ones. Uh, let's just skip over the uh, one jump ahead. I think skip over two one jump ahead. Wonder Bed and Mickey Mouse are kind of a hot debate right now. I think people have been uh, looking between, and I'm wholly in the favor of Wonder Bed. Um, and I've done, I did this recently with just some examples to uh, some people having that debate, where I just did a sample hand generator of this deck and essentially a similar deck with uh, Mickey Mouse. And the first thing that I said was we had a hand that had both Fishbone Quill and Wonder Bed in it. And I said, or Fishman Claw and Mickey Mouse, and I'm like, would you rather this had been one jump ahead or Mickey Mouse? And the obvious answer from how the game played out and how the deck, or the hand looked even, is that it would just be better as one jump ahead almost every time. The Mickey, Mickey Mouse may be better at helping buffer against a card like B King Undisputed, which is, again, a very problematic card at times. I think the velocity that one jump ahead gives you and the ability to play uh, on curve and up the curve is so dramatic that I, I think I'm always going to favor one jump ahead. I don't feel disadvantage in any matchup when going first if I play one jump on turn two. There's not a single matchup where I'm afraid of if I get to do that. Um, the line also of against a Flynn Rider when going first, you have one jump ahead, they play a uh, Flynn, you can then go you know, you start your turn with three ink, play my fourth ink for the turn, fish monk quill, activate it, I have two ink available, then a boom your Flynn. That's kind of lights out against most of the area with this deck. So getting up to five ink first there too and also having dealt with their threat. You won't have many cards in hand, you're probably going to need to hole in the world, but it's a pretty big swing there, and I, I don't know much many people that can come back from that. Whereas, conversely, if you had just played um, nothing on turn two and so they've had a one jump ahead and had a Mickey in hand, they played a Flynn and you have a Baboom in your hand, you can't then use Quill in any way or play Mickey to then check the, the Flynn, uh, and it, it just kind of gets a little bit messy. And I think just having a lower curve in general where you have more flexibility in your, your turn two play when you have 12 cards that you can play on turn two, whether it be one jump, a boom, broom, or Argus. That's a good number. I think 12 is a safe number. I think that one jump ahead is just superior the majority of the time. Again, the only reason I would consider Mickey over it is because I'd be worried about the number of B-King and Disputed being played. That's the only exception. I would keep one jump ahead in my hand against Ursula even going second because it forces them to have it. If they don't have it, it's great. If they do have it, they played an Ursula and not a Bucky on turn two. So I'm happy. So I think that the debate is kind of over in my head as far as to which one I would rather have. Um, people can play whichever one they like. I do understand that Mickey, Smee, Cogsworth is a very scary line in a mirror match. I understand that, and I'm willing to accept that because I think that the mirror match is not going to be as prevalent as the matchups having one jump ahead over Mickey Mouse helps in. And that's my logic for it all. Moving on. The removal suite. Baboom. Um, Baboom over a card like Fire the Cannons, for sure. Um... The main reason is Baboom is a card I can actively keep in my hand and not feel any which way about. I can keep it in my hand and not feel terrible the fact that it's not a matchup where I need that card. Fire the Cannons is a highly situational card where it has to be good or it's going to be a dead card in your hand unless you have a quill. I think that the flexibility that Baboom gives you, uh, being an inkable card and being able to keep it in your opening hand, no matter what you're playing against, I went as far as to, in a match playing for top 8, I was in the round of top 16 in Chicago, playing for top 8. I was playing against a Ruby Sapphire deck with uh, Maurice's Workshop. My opening hand had two Babooms. I kept both of them because I already had some acceleration pieces and I was able to just keep them and ink them so I'd never have to do the, draw them late. If I had the cannons, I'd had to mulligan and I'd had to potentially draw them later and I didn't want them in that matchup. So I think just the flexibility of being able to keep a card like Baboom versus Fire the Cannons in your opening hand, especially in an unknown matchup, which you're going to face a lot in challenges and at your local game store, maybe less so because you may know the opponent or have seen them play before or see them in between rounds. Uh, and know if that card's good. But I think just the ability to keep uh, an inkable card uh, that you can have the flexibility of using or inking is, is way higher than having a card like Fire the Cannons. Moving on to Rise of the Titans. Um, it's a concession to Queen's Castle. This deck is not 
the greatest at dealing with Queen's Castle. You really need to have some board presence already or one of your Rise of the Titans. There's that consideration to adding a third potentially over maybe a copy of Along Came Zeus uh, just to help answer threats like that. It has the flexibility, of course, to deal with items um, in a pinch, which makes it useful in Ruby Sapphire matchups. I think if I were to remove the beasts from my decks, I could then add a th- justify adding a third Rise of the Titans uh, and something else maybe in the beast instead. I, need, I would want another character or something like that. Um, but yeah, Rise of the Titans is, is pretty necessary, I think, to help combat uh, Ruby Amethyst and is a, is a card you definitely need to have access to uh, in some capacity. Zeus is kind of a flexible card. It helps um, deal with, as I mentioned, the castle a little bit. You have to combine it with some character to challenge into it, which doesn't always work out too well in your favor, honestly. Um, but it being able to kill a beast uh, or a Jafar or an Aladdin or anything out of green steel, really, except for Robin Hood uh, on face value, is is a very flexible card. Being able to sing it with your Talas or Flavor Shims, a huge deal. Um, and it can it can pair up with uh, some other things. You can, I think I've made the play where I you know sung a Zeus, played a Tinkerbell, and boom to Tamatoa. You know I, I did three cards into it, really two cards, and played my Tinkerbell to deal with Tamatoa. But you can do things like that. Um, but let it go. Let it go's primary function in this deck is to deal with giant things, namely Tamatoa. Tamatoa is the scarier card to see on the opposing side of the board uh, when playing this deck than a Lucky Dime because you have answers to Lucky Dime and Tamatoa is way harder to deal with. It's a card I don't like to keep in my hand ever, even when playing against the Ruby Sapphire matchup because you don't want to have to ink it early on, which you'll likely have to ink most of the cards in your opening hand uh, because you're game plan should be holding worlding sometime in the early game to, to get full value out of your hand with you know you want to be fish bone calling home worlding and stuff like that so let it go as a concession to needing an answers to tamatoa you could play hades i think if you maybe to remove beast and maybe remove the zeus's you could make room for hades as a threat that answers tamatoa but hades being susceptible to medusa has always been a, a pain pain point for for that card since uh set three um home world i don't see the purpose I, I don't see the reason to play this deck without it i'm i'm not going to dwell on it because people are set in their own ways with what they feel is correct um my rule for determining power level of cards and for understanding what you should play or shouldn't play and why i think a lot of people are going to be playing green steel in dallas is because if you think a card should be banned because it is too good why are you not playing that card when you can and people have called for a change or ban to home world probably more than any other card honestly that's existed in the game so when people talk about cutting it from their deck, I cannot understand their reasoning or logic. And you can say it's metagame dependent, but the power level of a card like Holner World is just too hard to ignore. And sure, Holner World is not great all the time in a mirror match where you're playing a lot of the same cards and you could be playing something else as like a threat instead of a Holner World. And sure, you can draw two to three copies of a Holner World and it can feel like a bad time in your opening hand, but the power level is just too hard to deny and I'm not going to. So I'm just going to play the card, and you can play whichever version you want. I'm going to be playing something similar to this. If I play Blue Steel in Chicago, there is, I will wholeheartedly say, a 0% chance I am going to play a Blue Steel variant that does not have Hole in the Wall if I play Blue Steel. I'll, st- I'll stop with that. Grabs, good for removal. Kind of pairs, good against Ruby Amethyst. Uh, but yeah, we've gone over the items there. These are pretty stock. No real changes to that. No real other inclusions. I've tried cards like Beast Mirror before. Uh, when I had Scuttles in the deck, just as a extra hit for an item, having 13 was a little bit better than having, you know, four or having 15 was a little bit higher than having 14, so it made a little bit of sense in that regard. But Beast Mirror is not that great. Moving on, we're gonna go to two decks that are kind of on the fringe, and I think get a not a big bonus from the removal of Bucky, but especially this one, which we'll start here. A deck that I think people have been not quite sure how to build or play uh, in this format. And I'm going to go ahead and said the name is very ironic. The name of the deck is Set 4 Flute. Uh, you'll notice there are zero Set 4 cards in this deck. Um, the only Set 4 cards to really consider for this deck would be the Ursula 2 costs, the 1-4, for the Singer 4, uh, Phil, uh, Philatides, which can combo with some heroes. Um, those are really the only ones that I would consider playing in this format, this deck. And I don't think they're good enough. Um, I think that the core of the deck was strong enough. And I think that this deck gained a little bit from set three. It gained Robin Hood Chain, which obviously is really good. Um, and it gained Bear Necessity, which is a card I'll talk about in a minute. But this deck has been powerful since set one. Set two, it got a huge boost with Queen. Uh, set three, it got Smee and Robin Hood and, and Robin Hood and Piglet, I guess, too. Um, 
but yeah, the core of the deck's been strong since set one. And I think a lot of what we were trying to do was actually just making the deck worse. We put cards like uh, Ursula in it. There's also no uh, Pride Lands. I don't think that the Uninkable is worth it. I don't think that the card is worth it. I don't think it's as good in um, against Green Steel as it may have been prior. I know Zach Bivens played it at, at, Dallas, uh, at Chicago. Um, and I saw him play a match against Green Steel for... Uh, four day two when he was playing to kind of get the highest seed um, and did some work there I think it could have been played around differently but my main concern with a card like Pride Lands right now especially is that people are when I when I talk to people right now the one of the biggest cards they they talk about having to fight is Queen's Castle and when everyone's kind of gunned for a seven seven lore or seven seven uh, willpower location I don't want to be playing an uninkable seven willpower location in my deck uh, where I can't make use of it or ink it when it's bad. I think that the fact that people are gunning so much for Queen's Castle makes uh, Pride Lands, which I already didn't like very much to begin with, even worse of a choice for for, for going forward. Um, this deck is relatively self-explanatory for what it does. The Queens, the Robin Hoods, are shift lines. They're the most powerful shift lines we do have access to. Um, one to one to five, and then you know from turn one, on turn one with queen to turn two queen going first, you get to hold world on turn two if you want. You get to play a storm or a strength if you really want as well. Uh, Robin Hood's the most consistent and uh, sturdy character to have exerted singing a hold world, though it can still die to certain certain removals. But those ones are pretty self-explanatory. Cinderella, one. I've seen people cut some number of, but I don't think it's correct. I think, again, when I'm talking about a card like Pegasus in blue-red, uh, like I did in the last video, you need to be building your decks to be going second. Cinderella is both amazing going first and second. Uh, Cinderella is so good going first at punishing your opponent for trying to kind of keep up with you by being a one-cost singer that you get to continue to develop characters as well as sing cards like Storm and Strength to just keep them from ever getting a, a foot in the game. But also when going second, it helps you catch back up by letting you develop and remove and interact with your opponent's characters. It being a dual purpose card there is is a huge, huge swing for it. And I, I can't imagine playing this deck without four Cinderella's. I know at the beginning of the format, we were a little bit worried of the uninkable Sisu that could kill one strength characters or less, kind of putting a uh, damper on Cinderella. And that certainly was a limiting factor in, in my mind of playing a card like Cinderella in this format, why I didn't want to adventure forth with trying out Amber Steel. Um, but I think that card has proven to be not as impactful as we would, we would have thought to be. And I, I think rightfully so. It's a little bit too... Uh, to put off the fact that Bucky is one of the most primarily cards played and you can't really have too much dead space in your deck when fighting a card like that. Uh, Cinderella Stouthearted, I can't get behind playing Cinderella without a shift line. You need it in some capacity. You need to threaten it, at least. Um, much like when I played uh, Stitch Rockstar in a deck where I had Stitch, I didn't really want a shift line in my deck. However, I was wanted a one drop in my deck, and I didn't really care what it was. I wanted one one cost two two. Stitch Rockstar happened to be the most threatening one in some other decks I was playing, not necessarily Amber Steel, but other decks as well. Just having the option to do it or threaten it was a is a really big deal. And Cinderella, of course, going from one to three can make your opponent have to second guess, play a, a little bit differently, or give them at least some pause as to what they're gonna have to remove. You know, maybe they remove a Smee instead of a Cinderella with a Medusa because they're more, or sorry, vice versa. They remove a Cinderella instead of a Smee because they're scared about Cinderella coming down and being shifted. Or maybe they know it can be shifted because they know it's in your hand, so they have to do it. But if you don't have a Cinderella in your deck or your hand or anything like that, you can't threaten that. And I think just that makes your opponent play in a way that it's worth including the inkable seven cost character, which again, it's inkable. So the worst case scenario, you can't play it, you just ink it. Worst case is probably top decking and you're on five ink and you don't have Cinderella in play. That's the worst, sure. But a few and far between, and it is just an incredibly powerful card that can win games that no other card can in this game. Uh, being able to deal with cards like Cogsworth is incredibly difficult for this deck. Uh, and one of the matchups I think this deck doesn't want to see is probably Blue Steel. Um, but into Green Steel and into Ruby Amethyst, the flute version, which again, this is a flute version. I've traditionally not liked flute, but you need to just view it as a different kind of card for this deck where it's just helping you close out games, not necessarily something you play on turn two all the time. You probably will if you have it, but you might develop something else if you can. But yeah, Cinderella is just a, an all-star and I, I really can't imagine playing this deck without at least two. Um, the package of Smee and Piglet, just the early game aggressive questers. Uh, Piglet is a captain for Smee to keep it from self-damaging. Piglet's also just a fine card in the mid to late game when you drop it after a Honor World. 
Even a piglet on an empty board by itself still threatens three lore the next turn because this deck has a plethora of creatures. This is the deck in the game that has the most amount of one-cost characters in it, period. No other deck has as many one-cost characters. No other deck can afford to play as many one-cost characters because a hole in the world refills the hand so quickly. This doesn't mean that you need to deploy all your one-cost characters all the time. It may be often correct to never play a second or third copy of them and use them for ink to go up the curve to an area when you're a little bit lacking on ink. I'd be very mindful of how many of those one-cost characters you do play. While you do have a bunch of them, this is not an aggressive deck. This is more of a, a combo deck or more of an aggro combo deck. This is not a rush, play all my things out, quest with everything, kill you deck. It can serve that way, but more often than not, this is a kind of connect the dots kind of deck where you keep the the one cost or the shift lines and you pair them together to hold a world and you kind of propel forward that way. But I would not treat this as an aggressive deck where you always play all of your one drops. You'll want at least one in play more often than not. But having a bunch of them, no, I don't, I don't think so. Ariel, a spectacular singer, um, is a card. I think I there are a couple cards in decks that I just call, they're just no mulligan, no mulligan cards, like things you've never mulliganed. And I think I've only ever mulliganed an Ariel when I had three other ones in hand. I think I've kept three one time, maybe. Maybe I've kept two. I don't know if I kept three, because just you know, probably would have to ink one in that instance. But Ariel is a card, I, if I have it, I'm, I'm never mulliganed period it's just the best card in the deck really it's it's the thing that kind of ties this whole thing together why a Honor world is so strong helping find it in this deck i mean there are other decks that could play Honor world that are steel but none of them get to play it as consistently as ariel uh, as, as amber Doug does with ariel so ariel uh no need for explanation there but never cut it i would never mulligan it um yeah for rapunzel uh the card we talked about earlier the pride lands does help rapunzel become a better card uh, having extra willpower on your characters will make you be able to heal for more for sure but rapunzel is fine in and of itself i wouldn't overvalue rapunzel in a lot of ways i wouldn't be afraid just to play it out as a one to five on turn four in some situations where you know you're gonna be holder worlding later in the game or the next turn but it certainly is a card that uh you know can just blow a game wide open with with robin hood or cinderella having a, the ability to take a ton of ton of damage then be healed up immediately um to just swing the race back in your favor as far as the card card war goes um robin hood and cinderella and the queen they're great they're just the shifters um moving kind of along to the the songs here i'm going to talk take a take a minute to discuss the two amber songs bare necessities and world's greatest criminal mind in the prior format i was not a fan of world's greatest criminal mind period i know that it was potentially included to deal with ruby sapphire uh and dealing with tomatoes and it still is true here it can also deal with Sisu or Maui or anything out of the deck that's big. Um, but the main reason that I've decided to include so many copies of it in this deck, where previously I wouldn't play any, uh, is Sisu. The three-cost Sisu will often be a target for World's Greatest Criminal Mind. And the fact that Ruby Amethyst and Ruby Sapphire and even uh, Blue Steel all have targets for it. There's Tomatoes now in Blue Steel, which there weren't before. Uh, more often than not, there were not Tomatoes, maybe one or two. But... The fact that those decks all have targets for it now, and the fact that it's an inkable song, and it is so incredibly good now that your Cinderella can kill Sisu, it can kill Flynn. It can it can sing to kill turn one plays, it can sing to kill turn turn three or four plays too. It's just an incredible tempo swing that this deck has really cemented itself being able to 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 be in that position to be the aggressive tempo deck where before you had to really rely on all your cards doing certain things and, and trying to squeak out little advantages that this one can really propel itself forward with world's greatest criminal mind taking out the primary three cost threat i would say out of out of ruby amethyst um in the early game and bare necessities there was a beginning point to this metagame where previously last format we would have two, usually three copies was about the amount we'd see in this deck down to two originally it was zero uh because a lot of the ruby ruby sapphire decks which were much more prevalent at the start of this metagame we're leaning on Sisu as their big removal and not be prepared more so to where you'd be you'd bear necessities in them, see a Sisu and just be demoralized to the point where your whole board's gonna get swept up and you can't take their their sweeper effect and it's just unfortunate. But moving back to Ruby Amethyst and how that deck plays now, they are back to four be prepared, which is a good concession for bear necessities to take. However, they also have cards like Brawl, which is not something we had to deal with before. Typically your aerials were safe to sing on turn four always. But now with the inclusion of Brawl, it's good to be able to take that kind of card out of their hands so they can't interact with your aerial if you need them to not. 
Additionally, it can take Queen's Castle, which has just been, again, one of their primary win conditions for the deck. They've actually gone less controlling and more aggressively based. So being able to keep pace with them and being an aggro control deck against a more mid-range deck is actually a, a perfect place to be and why I think this deck can creep back into the metagame. I do think as well, aside from World's Greatest Criminal Mind and Slebius Flute, the rest of the deck, except for those seven cards, is incredibly well positioned against uh, Ember, uh, Emerald Steel, Green Steel. It plays a very similar game plan to them, except it has Homeworld and can take advantage of Homeworld a lot better. There are, and the copies of Grab Your Sword, which is only two, you could potentially play more if you feel like you're going to... If you feel, again, I guess quickly, your metagame is more Green Steel based uh, than Ruby Amethyst based, you can add a third Grab Your Sword maybe over one of the world's greatest criminal minds. Um, that's a suggestion I could, I could see taking for sure. Um, but this deck, I think, inherently does have advantages over green steel and is something that if i was paired against green steel would be happy playing against with this deck it's not a walk in the park matchup like in blue steel maybe against green steel but it, i do feel you're inherently advantaged uh, just with how the cards line up you do need to answer some of their big threats but you do have the capability of doing so for sure and your top decks are just about as good as theirs with what you can do you both have you know the five cost characters that are shift lines which you they have beast you don't which is a detriment but beast is pretty easily dealt with when you have cards like storm strength and and things like that um Zeus helps, and the whole world just resets the game to where they may not be able to disrupt you as effectively as they did in the early game when they're relying on you to play out more cards than you would otherwise would need to if your hand just refreshed to seven versus starting with seven. So, uh, Storm and Strength, no explanation there. Whole new world, no explanation there. Sword, you could go to a third if you wanted to by cutting a world's greatest. You do have the leniency with one uninkable, I believe. Um, this deck isn't playing too, too many. Uh, how many is this here? 10, 16. You can go to 17. That's my cap for this deck, I would never go above 17, 16 I'm comfortable at, uh, 15 I'm happy with, 16 I'm comfortable, 17 I'm uncomfortable, but passing, 18 I would never. Um, but again, you do have to get lucky in some situations to, to win tournaments, and making yourself have a little bit less variance um, when it comes to inkable counts is somewhere where I like to be, but I can certainly see having a third grab your sword over the world's greatest. Slevious Flute, um, really the death knell you know, nail in the coffin against Ruby Amethyst and why this deck may be picking up a bit of steam as well. Again, I think it is okay enough against Greensteel to where I think you're slightly advantaged, if only a little bit. But against Ruby Amethyst, I think Sleepy's Flute has always been one of the one of the scarier cards for, for this color pair to have in that matchup there, just being able to close the game out in a way that they can't interact with. You know, much like we saw Spellbook at one point in time be played uh, in a significantly greater fashion than it is now, uh, Sleepy's Flute does help end the game and again this deck being as aggressive as it is and especially with Rumi Amethyst the biggest reason I'd say this deck is better in the metagame because Rumi Amethyst is popular for sleepy flute purposes and also the fact that we talked about how there's so little cards in their deck that cost less than three well when you hold the world something on turn three you're only afraid of them playing one card where you can play three or four the following turn with your stong deck and then hold the world again the velocity in which you can create by playing this deck into a deck that has such a clunky uh, you know, assortment of uh, ink costs there is really, again, another reason I think this deck might be well positioned. And again, you don't need cards from set four, people. This deck functions fine without them. There aren't any set four cards I'm actively happy to include in this deck, really. Ursula's okay, but I wouldn't cut a Piglet or a Smee for it. I wouldn't cut a Cinderella. I wouldn't cut any of the songs for it. This deck has 21 songs. Let's just keep it that way and keep it, keep the flutes going. So I'm a big fan. I've always liked Amber Steel. I've not really liked Sleepy Flute too much personally, but I can see the appeal to it, and this deck certainly has a place in the metagame now, I think. But yeah, big fan. Hope to see it. Hope Maybe we'll play it. Who knows? That'd be kind of funny. Imagine a set four challenge won by a deck that has no set four cards in it. That'd be fun. Lastly is a deck that's been a pet deck of mine forever since I played it. I think I was the first one to play this deck when... Uh, set two was legal. I think I built it on Dreamborn. There was a few thousand views on the deck and re reposted in the Twenty Lore Discord and stuff like that. But this deck was been Mufasa. It's a personal favorite of mine, um, and I played an online event with it. One of the reasons I've not been as keen on it uh, as of late and for challenges, as I don't think it serves that well in a two-game format setting. Not to say that it needs to be on the play to win. That's not why I'm why I'm hesitant to play in that sense, but I think that it needs to at least know what it's playing against going second to win most of the time, but also this deck's win rate against green steel specifically is very low. By very low, I don't mean you can't win games. You certainly can. I think over the course of probably 100 games, you'll win maybe, you know, 
split going first and second, probably 40 of them, maybe 35, 40 of them are on there. So it's, you know, not the greatest percentage wise of what you'll win, but it is a deck that I think is actually very good against most other things. Um, the best matchup from my perspective, playing both sides uh, of, of this specific version of the deck uh, that I want to play against is Blue Steel. This deck is, when I, when I play this deck a lot against Blue Steel, I think I had, that was the highest win rate matchup I had when playing this deck um, across the board. And it only got better with this set too, actually, uh, because of the characters on the four willpower that you get to include in this deck now. Uh, as opposed to before, you didn't have as many reliable sources. But um, this deck also, I think, is very good into Ruby Amethyst. I think that with how they've built their decks now, which is actually a little bit less controlling, a little bit more one-for-one, -one, cards like Bee King and Disputed are not as powerful uh, against this type of deck with a bunch of characters or or Muvasa in general. Um, but just inherently, their deck has changed to the point where I, I think that this deck is, is very good against that style of deck now. Um, They've gone a little bit more chunkier, not as aggressive, and this deck really only ever lost that deck when you they got under you, and they can't really do that anymore, I don't feel. Sure, Queen's Castle can be a little bit annoying, but you have plenty of ways to deal with it. Though I did remove some of the Maui's, which we'll get to, um, and rounding out the matchups there, kind of the big ones we've seen. I think it's good against Blue Steel, I think it's good against Ruby Amethyst, I think it is not good into Green Steel. You are very lucky to get a 1-1 split against Green Steel. Uh, I would say if you play this in the best of two, um, I think it's unlikelier to win the matchup. Um, and against Ruby Sapphire, I think you're about even. I think it's a close matchup to begin with, to be honest. Um, but I think in general, you're favored against someone who doesn't know exactly what they're doing uh, in that matchup. And you just certainly can have draws that don't line up very well against what they do, and they can have draws that do nothing against what you do. And sometimes there's two ships passing in the night, but you have an inherent advantage against them from having Mufasa and Flynn. Flynn is a very aggressive card, which we've seen a lot of those decks not be able to answer very early on and cause them to have... Uh, to struggle, really, when it comes to, to keeping up with the amount of lore being gained. But let's move on to the deck itself. Um, Mulan. Mulan is a card that I was the most excited for by a lot. The six-cost Mulan. Let's move to both of them. Six-cost Mulan, uh, the Elite Archer. The one when you shift it, it gets bust, bust, buffed strength. Uh, it can machine gun down an entire board. That Mulan is actually not as important in this deck. It serves a very similar function to the Cinderella, which we've talked about in the uh, Amber Steel Songs deck, the last format, where I'm playing the one-cost Mulan because I'm actually going to play that regardless if I play the big one or not, because it's a self-damaging character for Rapunzel, and I just want more of copies of those. And I kind of wanted a one-cost character anyway just to help keep up with some aggressive decks if you need to, against the less cur cursed merfolk running around than there used to be for sure. But self-damaging characters, you know, on turn five, you play Mulan, Rapunzel, that's whole, one whole less ink than a Mother Gotha would have cost you to, to get going and get some cards back. But I would be playing the one-cost Mulan even if I wasn't playing the big one. However, I want to make my opponents respect the one-cost Mulan as a threat in play. You can make your opponent play very strangely if you play a Mulan on turn four and in certain situations where you're able to just have that extra ink or extra card to be able to expend. They might play completely differently just because of the threat of the Mulan, especially if you've either inked one or if they've seen it in the previous game, if you're playing best of three or best of two even in game two, that threat is worth something. They may not be able to call that threat and sometimes they just have to play into it if they have, if they can because they have no choice, but the threat of it being there is far greater than it not being an option you have available to you. I think that even though you may threaten it, and not need to play the big Mulan, I think that it'll come up often enough where actually it will work out to where they may just be forced to play into it. And in those games, it looks incredible. And again, for an inkable card, that's really all you can ask for as far as the six cost Mulan goes. So I'm gonna kind of go over that part later, or issue that part later. I think Mulan's a fine card. I want the one cost one regardless. Uh, Flynn, again, it, it in conjunction with Sisu, which there are only three Sisus in this deck, but that's a, there's a different reason for that. Just a very aggressive card against the one jump ahead decks, um, just making sure that you punish them a bit, get a little bit ahead on the lore race. Uh, not much to say there. Lumiere, uh, a similar sense, it helps actually dodge Brawl in a lot of ways. Lumiere is a very powerful card and helps change the math against cards like Queen's Castle. It helps your Mulan and Mother Gothel take down a Queen's Castle by itself, it helps your Doc and Mulan or any two copies, any two cards that really, you know, one has three power, one has four, two, which is very common for this deck. A lot of two powers, a lot of three powers. Um, it helps those trade into a Queen's Castle. It, again, it, one of the main functions it does serve is if played on turn two, it protects your Gaston or Doc from getting brawled. That's one of its main reasons. Uh, Sisu, Big Sisu, has seen, a, again, a little bit of a downtick in play because of Blue Reds, a little bit downfall there, but it does help there as well, protecting your board against uh, Sisu, because uh, otherwise pretty much everything dies, uh, which is unfortunate. 
But yeah, Lumiere is a great. It also can make trades happen uh, in ways that your opponents aren't expecting. Say you have a Lumiere in play and they quest it with a Merlin Rabbit. Your super goof can now come down and challenge the rabbit and survive and kill the rabbit. Good exchange. Mother Gothel can trade up to a Sisu. Good exchange. Things like that. Um, moving along here, Mother Gothel, self-explanatory, self-damaging character with Rapunzel. Fantastic, you know, since set two, that, that combination has been a real draw to this color pair. Kind of the marquee reason to play this color pair has been Gothel, Rapunzel. Um, and Doc has been uh, a key part of accelerating to that point where you get to play those ahead of schedule because they can be a little bit clunky. Those things aren't actually very powerful, and 2 3 for 3 is fine. Being able to reduce the cost of a character is good. But really, the biggest inclusion and one of the best ones from set 4 uh, has been Gaston. And Lumiere protecting Gaston from Brawl is also another big reason for Lumiere's inclusion. Gaston is uninkable, it is a 2 4 that reduces by 2. So. What this deck really aims to do, especially when going first, is it gets to play the the blue-red kind of game plan of go from two to four. Kind of like we saw Fishbone Quill go immediately to Tinkerbell, or in, out of blue-red you see Fishbone Quill go to Madame Medusa. The deck gets to do the same thing, so it just plays Gaston. Gaston into Tremaine or Medusa is incredibly powerful in any kind of character mirror match, and one of the things I was worried about at the start of this format was the potential for this deck's mirror match, because it was very popular at the beginning before people figured out Green Steel, which is a very bad matchup. But the person going first always got to Gaston Medusa, their opponent's Gaston, and that was a really big backbreaker and actually made the play draw disparity even worse. But luckily we haven't seen too much of this deck and that hasn't really become a part of the metagame to the point of concern. But the inclusion and the importance of Doc and Gaston is only why there's three CSUs on the curve. I think that just overall I wanted more cards that had higher casting cost or, or lower cost just to fill the curve a bit better. 11 three cost characters is enough. A fourth C2 this deck would like, for sure, if I could fit it, but I don't think you can. I don't think I want to. Uh, Rapunzel needs no introduction. C2 is just a good pair with Flynn. Aggressive character helps uh, you know, get the lore going, for sure, against the uh, the blue decks, the, the, the Ruby Sapphire and the Staff, uh, Sapphire Steel decks. Hard to kill. You know, No no four damage spells uh, that, that really exist there, except for uh, Along Came Zeus. Super Goof. Super Goof is a card that, man, did this one fall flat on its face from everyone's ex expectation, right? I feel like it hasn't found its home, but I also feel like that's partially in fault because of Bucky. Um, I think Bucky has actually held, held back Super Goof a lot. I think Super Goof is going to be a card that we see a lot more of now that Bucky's gone. The reason being is that what Bucky allowed the player playing Bucky to do was not quests with anything that could ever be challenged, just wait till their hand was empty, from your, your opponent's hand was empty, and then start questing when it was completely safe and they'd kill everything. So they didn't have to do anything. They got to just sit there passively, remove all your cards, play a beast, draw some cards, now I'll start questing. And Supergroup had no time to do anything. There was nothing to challenge. There was no characters exerted that ever was challenged, and its ability never came up. However, this deck, even with in the face of Green Steel, I would still probably include some number of goofies, because this deck can get kind of brick walled at the end of certain games to where you just need to help have the ability to close out the game and being a situational uh, way to gain two lore that sometimes in the early game can help check a card like Cinderella or a stray Robin Hood that's able to get challenged or anything like that. I think Super Goof's worth the inclusion and Lumiere actually helps it out a bit too. Um, just get a little bit better and, and trade for more things but neither here nor there in that. I think Super Goof is due for a an emergence uh, once Bucky is removed from the metagame because Green Deal can no longer just sit on its hands and make you discard everything, and eventually the, the timing for Super Goof, which is a card that does need the right timing, which Bucky denied you the ability to time things, will come up. Uh, Mufasa, yeah, I mean, that's why we're playing most of the characters. There are three non, or, sorry, five non-characters in this deck, but Mufasa is still just fine regardless. I think the common example I use when talking about um, how to feel about having some misses in your deck is... I refer to playing Pokemon Red and Blue, like the original Pokemon card game, or the video games, um, where there was, I think, the some of the attacks like Thunderbolt and Thunder, or Hydro Pump and Surf. You know, Hydro Pump and Thunder had miss rates. They were like 85% to hit. It's kind of like what Mufasa is. Sometimes you had to push it because, you know, 85 is still a good good number to hit, and it's fine. I think having some misses is okay. I think five's my, five is my... Six is probably the cap I'd ever play in a deck, but five is fine. Um, and people can't play banking on you missing or expecting you to miss much, so it may skew their play anyway. Uh, without even having, you know, 100% guarantee to hit. Maui is a card, again, kind of in lieu of how challenging has been this format with against Greensteel specifically. I think it's come up less so. Uh, that may change with their move of Bucky. Mordex may be questing, and, and maybe Maui comes back in full force. But I think that this deck hasn't needed 
to uh, rely on Maui as much because Gaston into Tremaine and Medusa backed up with characters, which isn't often what we see Tremaine and Medusa do. They're usually catch up mechanics that are the first character being played onto a board, more so than complementing a slew of characters. I think Maui's not been as necessary to help complement them. Um, not much to say about Tremaine and Medusa. They've been mainstays since they've been printed. Part of our uninkable count that really drives uh, the deck forward and, and what kind of restricts some of our, our deck building choices, but they're very powerful and they're very hard to remove from the deck. Uh, Mulan, we've seen, obviously, I've talked about at length. Um, I would still play the one-cost Mulan without the big Mulan if you don't want to play it, but I think you should play it regardless. Um, even one, but I think two is fine. Um, Carefree Surfer Stitch, one of my favorite cards in the game. Uh, just a home run hit uh, against any of the Ruby Amethyst decks, just a card draw against Ruby Sapphire as well. It just helps you get to the mid to late game. Uh, keep the card flow going, doesn't care too much about being prepared. You can play it into a turn where you're forcing them to be prepared. If they don't, they're just going to lose. But if they do, then you still drew two cards kind of thing. Great flip off Mufasa. You might want to make sure that in some board states where you're using Mufasa to trade on your own turn, that you have a second character played beforehand if if need be, to make sure that if a flipped stitch does happen, you have two characters still. So preempt your your own Mufasa flips on your turn with having making sure you have two characters in play just to make sure stitch hits. Better yet, if it's a Gothel or Mulan, you can also flip a Rapunzel uh, with your Mufasa trade to make sure you can heal something. But yeah, wouldn't cut a stitch. One of the best cards uh, for this deck and still in the game if it's you know it has the the room to be played. Um, Maleficent Dragon, uh, a concession more so than the blue decks, the Tamatoa decks. Uh, while Tremaine can answer them, we've seen a lot of people try and respect uh, the card Beaking Undisputed a bit more than they had been prior. Uh, and you do need to be able to answer cards like Tamatoa. It's one of the biggest problem, at, problem cards for this deck. Uh, being able to answer some threats on your opponent's side isn't always the easiest. And Tamatoa can control the game. And also, even in situations where Tamatoa isn't as threatening lore-wise, you need to remove it because a incredible tempo swing that your opponent can do if you leave a uh, tomato in play for any given time is using it just to sing and be prepared if they're able to do that and then deploy an additional threat your deck isn't very good at then catching back up beyond that sure you can remain in situations where that happens but having a maleficent to stop that from ever happening and keeping you on the on the front foot is really where you want to be Chernabog, uh, I wish I could play more, but I think one's about all I have room for with the unequal count. Um, a concession in some ways to whole world decks. It's very good against them if you draw it. Helps you from never getting decked in some situations if you want to recklessly draw through your deck with Rapunzel's and, and Stitches, which doesn't come up too often. But a fine card in a mostly character deck. Uh, I'd love to play two if I could, but I don't think you can. Um, the inclusion of Lantern. I think that Lantern, uh, I could see playing four still. I like three for right now. I like guaranteeing myself having some form of acceleration, meaning Doc, Gaston, or Lantern. Those are the cards I'm looking for in my opening hand most of the time. I don't think this deck's ever mulligan to Rapunzel. I don't think it's ever mulligan to Lantern. I don't think I've ever mulligan to Doc. Or not Doc, Gaston. I've mulliganed Doc when I have Gaston or Lantern sometimes, but acceleration is pretty key. And having a couple copies of Brawl is a concession to both uh, green steel and uh, blue steel you know killing hirems is pretty good you have medusas but you don't always get to get to them in the same time frame that you'd like to they're mostly for diablos diablos are really hard to come hard to come back from it's actually in my opinion the card holding back this deck more so than bucky is diablo uh, this deck can top deck just as well as green steel if not better in some situations and bucky while annoying diablo is what makes it so that the discard happens early enough to where it matters so much so and when you're top decking cards like Rapunzel or Stitch, it's really hard to justify using them to draw cards when your opponent gets to draw two cards as well, when their cards can be a, you know, we don't talk about Bruno or, or just a strength when they have Ursula in play. And Ursula also being answered by Brawl is another upside to it as well. So that's why the inclusion here, again, I think this is the maximum number, the maximum number of non-characters I could see would be adding a third Brawl over something if you wanted to or you just felt so inclined, but I wouldn't go beyond six uh, in general just to keep Mufasa, you know, likely to hit. But yeah, that's the deck. Uh, I've been weary about playing it. I mean, if my locals decides to have everyone abandon Green Steel and play something else, I'd play this. Yeah, but I would I would gladly play this deck in a field where I was knowing not to play. Or I was not going to play against Green Steel, or if I felt like I was only going to play against it once in the tournament at most, uh, then yeah, I'd play this deck for sure. Um, it is very good against I think Blue Steel, Ruby Amethyst, and I think even uh, Blue Red, and even Amber Steel. I think it's fine against. I think. One of the main reasons this deck got a lot better against the Steel decks is because Gaston has four four willpower. Gaston's really hard to kill early on. It can't get Stormed, it can't get Strength. Usually, previously, Doc could get Strength when, uh, even when going first, when they got to go Cinderella into 2-drop into Ariel, then Strength your Doc. They can't do that against Gaston. So I think that this matchup against Amber Steel Songs and against Blue uh, 
Blue Steel has gotten way better because of Sisu and Gaston uh, to the point where I'm not too worried about those matchups anymore where typically they were able to keep you off of pace. I would say I want another Maui if I was expecting a lot of those types of decks, uh, maybe over a goof, but in general, I think this deck is a good choice if there's no green steel. So that's my kind of wild card pick for the format. But the other five decks are pretty much what I played against in uh, Chicago and what I expect to see in Dallas as well. We'll see what actually happens here, but thanks again everyone for, for tuning in. I know this has been a long two sets, two parts, part one, part two, this is part two. I uh, hope you guys enjoy me talking about these six decks and the specific card choices and why I decided to go with them. And good luck in your set championships and in, in Dallas. Say hi if you see me there.